Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Melter. I'm going to be giving a presentation on LED lighting and why color spaces and different types of color are important in understanding how to program displays with LEDs. Um, I am uh, an MIT alumni, uh, not in any sort of computer course. Uh, my undergraduate degree was physics, my PhD was in material science. So I will probably not be showing you much in the way of fancy code. This is uh, generally going to be a little heavy on the math side, a little heavy on the physics side. So hopefully it won't be too boring. Uh, I'll first point out this array in front of me. This is a uh, toy that we put together recently. It has uh, 12 independent LED lights. Each of them is 10 watts with red, green, blue, and white. Uh, periodically throughout the presentation, it may go dark. What it is doing is using an onboard microphone in order to do audio responsive effects. So that would be an excellent time for hecklers to shout, <laughs> as they will probably be blinded by the array. Okay, so uh, to start the talk, first I wanted to just sort of generally talk about what people have in mind when they're talking about color. So we have right here, this is something that most people are probably familiar with. We've got the wavelength of light coming in associated with a particular color. Now, down at the bottom, we have something that we all probably learned about in elementary school art class. We have the color wheel, and we have primary colors. So, how do we get from this to this? Sort of the first question. Uh, I've, I've had people tell me that they think that red, green, and blue are the only colors, uh, and that every other color is just green blue. And um, it's only true when you're talking about perceptual color. Basically the idea is with red, green, and blue you can simulate in your eye the chemical response that you would get from seeing any of these other colors in the spectrum. So, uh, yeah, primary colors. So first here's a, I guess a little bit of biology. In your eye you have three different types of cones, most of us. Some people have four, some people have two, most of us have three. Uh, we have one here that is detecting light out in the short frequency, or short wavelength. This is basically blue, uh, it's known as the L receptor. And we have the M receptor that's detecting light at around a peak of 534 nanometer. That's the middle of the road cone. And then over here we have a long wavelength detector. Uh, and so this is actually a absorbent spectra for the cones themselves. So this has uh, a relationship to the way that we perceive light, but this is actually very fundamental. You can take these out of your eye, you can put them on a, uh, you can put them on a petri dish, and you can get this spectrum out of the actual chemicals in your eye. So this is the root of our color detection. Uh, one thing that is particularly strange about this is we have this long wavelength detector actually has a double peak. So we have a second peak down here in the blue. So what happens because of this? Yeah? Does that mean that you have very short wavelengths it's supposed to have purplish? Exactly. So this, is, this explains why in a color wheel, purple can be made by mixing red and blue. If you think about it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. All the other colors, you can sort of say, oh, well, if you mix two wavelengths together, you get, a, uh, you get a perceptual color that's sort of in between. It's not the same way for red and blue. If you mix red and blue together, you get something that's oh, on the wrong side of blue from red. Uh, and the reason for that is because you have this double peak of red. So if it weren't for that double peak, our vision would not have a circle that would be a line. Uh, I guess uh, I should point out, I'm going to label this X, Y, and Z. Later on, when I'm talking about the way people define color spaces, uh, X, Y, and Z are uh, sort of a proxy for the total absorption by one of these particular chemicals in your eye. What's up? What's the Sorry. What's? Oh, 498 is the um, the cones. So that's overall uh, that's overall brightness for dark vision. So here we get to actually people trying to understand the way the eye works. So this is uh, stuff that was done back in 1931, or in some cases earlier, by CIE. What they did is they took this, and then they turned it into a perceptual model by taking into account how effectively your eye is able to uh, perceive particular wavelengths, as well as uh, the density of cones in your eye. 
So this is the perceptual version of the physics model. So we're getting a little more abstract away now from the underlying biology. So here we've got the same approximate peaks, but now you can see a much more distinct second peak for red. This uh, more distinct pink peak for second red makes it a little more obvious where this uh, violet effect comes from. It's slightly to the left of the peak of the blue. Uh, these dotted lines here are actually the wavelengths that you would find if you were to purchase a, uh, an LED light with a red LED, a green LED, and a blue LED. So you can see a red LED is actually uh, stimulating out here way past the red peak, or the long wavelength peak. You've got the green LED is stimulating significantly to the uh, away from red side of the green phosphor. And then you have blues to the right here. So that way when the red intensity goes up while the blue intensity is high, you start to perceive the violet. Uh, up here, got a little bit of math. It's not too important, but basically the idea is if you had a delta function where you had a single wavelength of light coming in, you'd be able to take this and you'd be able to correlate that back to the physical model. Um, so if you have a complicated spectrum of light, you can do this integral of these functions and you sort of get back to the original uh, physics. So the next step is to make it even more abstract by taking into account that double peak. So the way that people do that is they develop, a, they develop this thing called a chromaticity diagram, which is basically the exact same graph from the peak previous page, except wrapped around in a big loop, and then connected across uh, in this sort of imaginary space where red and blue mixed together starts making violet. Uh, inside here, we can see color temperature uh, for whites. So this is like the, the black body color of a uh, cold object, and here's the black body temperature of a hot object. So uh, now we get to the idea of these primary colors. Uh, on this grid, we can place light sources, and then we can draw a triangle connecting them. And then the idea is that anything inside of this triangle is a color that we can produce with the colors, uh, with the primary colors we've chosen. So in the case of HDTV, we have this color, this color, and this color segmenting off a section of the diagram. Uh, and uh, you may be taking a look at this uh, question I've got over here. If you can figure it out, uh, I guess, you know, pull it till the end. <laughs> So if we want to actually produce a color inside of a given color space, we can take this triangle out and we can pick a point. And basically what we do is we apply multiple lever rules where we are uh, proportionally mixing the two colors together in order to get something that's in between. So in this case, if this is red, this is green, this first bar indicates that we've got slightly more red than green. And then this short one here indicates that we've got less blue than we have greener red. So by mixing red, green, and blue together, we can move, we can move from here out to this color in the middle. Uh, but there's a problem with this model, uh, whereas if you are using an RGB color space, and I'm gonna, this is starting to get more into device specifications. So everything prior to this has been moving in a more abstract direction away from the, the first physical principles. Now we're really starting to get into the properties of the specific color model. So if we're using the RGB values, this is a relatively straightforward plot. Um, you've got down on this axis the intensity of, say, your green LED. And on here, you've got the intensity of, say, a, a red LED. And then each of these two points represents that color being fully on. The problem we have is when we try to mix them together, Say you want to make uh, yellow, so the, uh, the natural way that a lot of people will use the RGB color space first would be to say the yellow should be red is equal to 100%, green is equal to 100%. And that does make fine yellow. The problem is if you look at power output. So this is uh, basically the, the physical power of the light. The amount of power going into the, each LED is twice as high for yellow as it is for red or green, if you do it that way. Um, so there's this section of color space in which the brightness that you can achieve is brighter than the smallest 
the maximum brightness you can get for a primary color. So let me say that again. It's a little bit confusing. <laughs> Basically, if you have a red LED that's outputting one watt, and you have a green and a blue LED that are each outputting one watt, if you have red and green both at 100%, you're outputting two watts, which is twice as much power as you can possibly put into only red. So this is a problem when you're trying to do things like color phase, uh, or if you give people arbitrary control over choosing red, green, and blue values to display on the light. Um, the, the worst scenario is white. If you're taking a white uh, output, you have red, green, and blue all at 100%. Now it's three times as much power output as if you were just displaying red. So this is a problem perceptually when you're trying to put together a nice looking display. <clears throat> So the solution that I would like to use for this, and I encourage everybody else to use too, is something called the HSI color space. There's HSV, which everybody may be familiar with. It's what's used on computers. Um, the problem with HSV is that value is defined as max of red, green, and blue. So this was done, I assume, largely because they needed the computational time. But by defining value in such a way that red, green, and blue can all be equal to one, and value is equal to one, it makes it so that if you shift the sh if you shift the hue and the saturation, well, the value constant, your output power changes. So this is problematic. Uh, the HSI color space compensates for this by defining a value called intensity, which instead of max is the average of red, green. So intensity here is, is uh, measuring the real power output from a LED spot. So here we've got a color wheel. This color wheel has been unraveled into this next graphic that I found. Uh, Felipe Colantoni, I guess. He had some paper that he published from that nice drawing here. So this is mapping the red, green, blue color space onto hue versus saturation versus intensity. And you can see that if you look down at these loops here, the primary colors all have a lower maximum intensity than the secondary colors, and all of them have a lower intensity than the whites you can get. So what I basically use is a truncated HSI model where I go in, I find the minimum value that the RGB values can produce, which is going to be a primary color, and then I chop off all the possible RGB values that are above that. This guarantees that in the color space I use, you can't be in a scenario where you vary human saturation and are causing the brightness to go above a value that is valid for all possible values and saturation. So when you look at the advantages and disadvantages of this truncated HSI model versus RGB, basically for the color with HSI, you can use hue, which is an intuitive value that is a descriptor for the uh, color. You have uh, whiteness, which has a single intuitive value called saturation, literally defined by how white the color is. That's, uh, people have different technical definitions, but that's the uh, dictionary definition. You've got the brightness, which is a single intensity that if you leave it constant, the device will consume constant power. Uh, and then versus RGB, where if you change color, whiteness, or brightness, you're gonna have to change all three red, green, and blue values independently in a complex relationship that is not at all straightforward for an end user. Uh, in terms of different types of effects that you would want to do, uh, truncated HSI makes a lot of them really easy. If you just want to do a color wheel, all you have to do is leave intensity at 100%, saturation at whatever you like, and increment hue until you get to 360 and then wrap around. Much easier than RGB, where again, complicated math. Uh, next, if you want to make a specific hue more pastel, all you have to do is decrease the saturation. Leave the intensity constant, you don't have to worry about the brightness going up, you don't have to worry about uh, any complicated math there. If you want to increase the brightness, you just increase the intensity, whereas with RGB, you're going to have to increase each of R, G, and B linearly in proportion with the amount you want the intensity to go up. Uh, the downside of the truncated HSI color space is that the white is only one third of its maximum power, so this can be a problem if you really, really, really need a bright white light. Um, and in, actual, in order to actually change, uh, to, to take an HSI value and actually convert it into an RGB value that you're displaying on your device, you are going to have to do complicated math at that point. So you can't get a, you have to do the complicated math at some point, 
But this model makes it so that the end, so the end user is mostly transparent. So here's some example code that I partially wrote. A friend of mine is a mathematician who can help me with some of the conversion routines. But basically, the, uh, this, this is all available up on our website, so you can download all of this via GitHub or anything you would like. But basically, this is a graph showing hue from 0 to 360 degrees versus the intensity for red, green, and blue. As we're doing a color fade, with full saturation using, using HSI. So you can see that the values always add to one, which is good. Uh, they do have a slight curve to them, which is the, it's a function of the mapping from a circle onto, uh, onto a triangle. And uh, you can see it, it basically has the correct behavior. This is what the HSI to RGB function looks like if all that I do is decrease the saturation to 50%. So not changing anything about what the user sees except for one value, it's able to very easily change into this other function where the sum is still always equal to one, but now the color is balanced out by opposing colors to introduce some white. So the biggest drawback uh, that I found for red, green, blue LED lighting is that they have very poor white. Uh, basically, you've got an issue where if you're increasing the saturation from 0 to 1, at 0 saturation, you always end up with one third red, green, and blue. And then as you move out at a particular angle in hue, you end up following basically lines. But um, the way that these are mixed together is uh, it's rarely a very straight line to what we would consider to be white. Generally, it's going to take some sort of path where it's going towards the blue or something. Is that specific to you know the brand type and chemistry of the LEDs that you're particularly using? So that line with different slope and you know wiggliness for different LEDs physically? Um, yeah, sort of. Uh, in this particular color space, that's all been abstracted away, so um, it's not visible to me as the person programming the light. Uh, if I wanted to actually do color matching, that's um, well, I, I call it an advanced topic, and we have stuff about it up on the blog. But I want to try to fit it all in. So where, where do those lines then come from if it's not specific to the, the physical LED? Uh, so you're taking the color circle and you're placing red, green, and blue, and hue is just the standard color needle. It's, uh, there are some... Oh, there's sort of specific hue of 15 degrees. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we're, we're sort of pretty far away abstracted from the actual definitions of the red, green, and blue. Right, I understand. So basically, this is the solution we came up with which is, why not add a white LED? So you add a white LED, now your whites are going to be, well, white, because you've turned off, you've turned off all of the other colors. So that's what all of these are here. Um, so there is a problem with this, though, which is now we've gone from a three-dimensional space to a four-dimensional space, which for any of you who may be mapping people, means now we have a fully degenerate conversion. If we have a, any given hue, saturation, and intensity other than the trivial values of fully saturated red, green, and blue will have an arbitrary number, an infinite number, of combinations of red, green, blue, and white that you can use in order to walk out to that specific color. So this is a bit of a problem. Luckily, it's not too bad of one, because the solution is to always, basically what we're doing here is that this algorithm will identify first the quadrant in which the color is located on the color wheel. And then we do is we, we uh, mix together the fully saturated color, which is really easy to calculate, and then we mix it linearly with white in order to move it towards pastel. So this is actually a much easier conversion routine to calculate than to red, green, blue. With red, green, blue, instead of moving from here towards there, you're actually going to end up moving from here towards blue. So you would end up with some nasty white color down in this area, whereas here we're actually moving in a very nice direction towards pastels. Uh, at some point, this will be showing pastels. Uh, so you can take a look there. Uh, I think you'll find that compared to pretty much every LED light, they're much nicer looking uh, than what you'll find with just red, green, blue. So when you implement this solution, for which there's also code on our website, uh, now when you try to carry the saturation of a 15 degree color, you end up linearly varying red and 
green in order to make the yellowish color that's described by 15 degrees. And then you're just linearly mixing it in with white in order to, in order to um, meet the constraint that the total power is one. <coughs> so uh, that is all the time I've got. So basically, uh, feel free to visit our blog. We've got a pile of more advanced topics, everything from how the audio responsiveness on these lights works to how to build an audio amplifier system to uh, how to what to why you need 16-bit color for the color correction. Uh, so feel free to visit. Feel free to visit that. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to throw them out at me. I may or may not have the answer, but happy to try. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So I, I'm trying to understand exactly um, what the problem you were correcting for by addition of white light was. Um, so I mean, assuming you know these are like idea LEDs and the brightness you know perfectly corresponds to voltage or whatever. Okay. Um, is it just actually that that just you know by just linearly interpolating these sort of RGB components together for some reason you can't like somehow reproduce like I guess like is this any different from our standard computer screen? Um, it is different. Um, I have a couple of theories as to why it's different. I think the dominant one is that the discrete LED dies are very large and they're not if they're not on top of each other visually. Uh, so I think this is probably the biggest issue, is if you look at a red, green, blue LED light fixture, you're going to, it's not, it's not uniform. So you end up with a spotlight shining on the wall showing splotches. Um, those are just perceptually ugly. And, but with this system, if I wanted to make pink, I'm mixing red and white together. And so it may still not be perfectly uniform, but it's a heck of a lot nicer looking than if you had variations in hue uh, as a function of position in the system. Um, the second one is that even in a perfect system, because of what he was talking about with what the actual frequencies of the lights are, um, so the, the way that that algorithm works, uh, I, I know I didn't go into the details here much, but if you look at the way blue is calculated, in order to decrease the saturation, all that it's doing is mixing in blue linearly with red and green. It's using blue the same way that you would use white in my algorithm. So what this is actually doing is it's taking red and green, uh, it's taking red and green and just barely shifting, it's, it's gotta shift around simultaneously what the red and green ratio is and mix it in with blue in order to make it so that it's following a path towards white. And this is just, it, it's, it's just nasty. Um, if you're mixing it with white, you can be 100% guaranteed that when it's fully unsaturated, it will be white. Whereas if you have 100% red, green, blue, even if you do color correction for uh, the eye and make it so that the, the correct output levels are there, um, even then, it's very difficult to guarantee that it's going to be exactly right. It would actually kind of be a cool demo if you could turn this like on and off, um, just to see, like, see what the difference is. I, I thought about it um, right at the time, but that's for the company. It sounds a little like the same like game mode that these players use. Is it kind of along the same solution? Um, that's when they use a, uh, you know, science agenda and uh, yeah, they have a little black. Uh, I, I suppose it's on the level, it, it could be seen as a parallel path that the CMYK is attractive, so it's, uh, it's a different, I mean, it's a different type of color space, but it does have the same issues with four dimensionality. And, uh, I think that K is sort of similar to whiteness, right? Yeah, and you're, it's you're, black for black. your color scheme is actually an exact inverse of those four colors. You take the actual inverse of yeah. yeah, those four, you get red, green, blue, white. So you're just doing the added inverse. Excellent, excellent. It's always good to reinvent the wheel upside down. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? How baloney do you think? Uh, what's the company that makes yellow LEDs in their TVs? Oh, uh, yeah. Those things, the four color TV. How, how baloney so, is that? So actually, I, I think they're probably nonsense because the signal coming in is going to be preferred in some really weird way. But I actually, the very first LED light that I ever built trying to go out there, outside of the RGB color space, I did pick yellow. Um, because you can't actually access yellow inside of the RGB tripod. Um, now, you kind of have to wonder, when I cyan, right? Uh, I, in, in my experience, people can't tell the difference between cyan 
uh, it's actual cyan, and cyan is picture of red and green. So um, it's probably just nobody's noticed, but I actually the I actually have an LED light that has uh, red, red orange, uh, red, red orange, amber, green, cyan, blue, royal blue, and UV. Uh, for use with LED. Uh, it's it's seven it, or eight different types of LEDs that I put all into one light. Uh, the reason for that being that I, I work with uh, physical artists who paint, and if you, uh, I, it's it's in the advanced stuff on the blog. But basically, the idea is if you've got a yellow pigment. The yellow pigment is every every actual physical yellow pigment is in fact reflecting from red out through or from green out through red. So what happens is if you have a yellow swath on a painting, and then you shine an LED light on it, if you start with red, the yellow reflects the red, the yellow reflects the red. Then you mix in green, and the red spot turns yellow, and the yellow spot turns green, which is not what the artist expects to see. They expect to see if you put the yellow section next to a red section, that they'll do different things. But it ends up being that you have, uh, say you have three, three blocks, one that's green, one that's yellow, one that's red. If you do color changing from red through green, the red will be bright, the green will be dark, and the yellow will be red. And then as you shift towards green, all three of them will be open. And then when you turn off the red, the yellow will be green. It's, it's just very non-intuitive, so I designed a very specialized light so that it's actually using real yellow, and the real yellow doesn't activate the red or the green, so you end up with uh, effects that are a little easier to, to parse as somebody who's not a. I, I don't want to. I don't want to force people who are really good artists to learn everything there is to know about uh, models of the eye. Of course, this is basically. What do you call somebody that's really good at colors and describing them? I don't know. Zoologist. I'm a scientist, so I, I mean, honestly, I would say mathematicians are almost more than anything. Like, there's a heck of a lot of math in <laughs> these. Um, but it's a combination of biology, math, and chemistry, so complicated. Are, are there any other LEDs in the market that um, do what you're describing as well, or why does it have to bring it up to the other one? It does not exist. What? It does not exist. So these are actually, um, these are actually, each one is an Arduino. Are you serious? Yeah, one of those is, a, is an Arduino Leonardo. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to say that technically they're Arduino Leonardo's, but they will be programmable with the exact same firmware. Um, and it has four channels, 16 bit PWM, which is 48 bit, it's something like 100 trillion different individual uh, RGB values that can be addressed. Uh, most lights are going to be red, green, blue, and 8 bit. Um, and no white. A handful have white. Um, still 8 bit. Down. This is all open source and open hardware. Put them things up there. Our USB. <laughs> we wanted something that was a little more flexible. Um, um, the other fixtures are also just outside of our price range. Uh, these, these we were attempting to sell for about $100. So a 10 watt red, green, blue LED light. That's 10 watts. Uh, this you're, actually you're lucky to find that for the mixer can be on so try to decrease the quality. Well I will say you've taken a little you've taken Arduino and make a light weight experiment to its like logical final conclusion. That was actually the original thought. Well, I, I mean I, I've been doing this before there was an Arduino, but um, it occurred to me that everybody's very first electronics project is to make an LED blank. So I'm like you know, I should really just make an Arduino that already has the LEDs built in. So there are some complexities to this. I mean, I've got, these are 700 milliamp uh, LEDs, and they're hard to solder. If somebody were trying to do this with an Arduino, they, like an actual off-the-shelf one, they'd have to buy special drivers, and they'd have to get all these LEDs starboards and all the soldering and stuff. And then they have to heat sink it. And, uh, not that not you get into it too much, but like, you got to, you yeah, have probably from the same girl, so it'll all end up melting. Each one is totally independent. Each one has its own microphone and uh, is doing its own built in audio analysis uh, in order to figure out how to do things in audio Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed about this, if you use pure 
purity blue and purity red. They're not too far from what you see in real life. But if you use pure RGB uh, green, it looks really way, 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 way green and really alien. Do you know why this happened? Nope. I, I, I can show you this plot. This is what's going on. Uh, this is the actual wavelength of the green. Uh, but even that, that green, it's picking up quite a bit of red. So it should be a real color. Um, you can get the imaginary colors if you stare at your bright red light and turn on a green light, where you've exhausted the red photoreceptors, and then you see colors that are actually outside the consistent diagram. But that's uh, probably not 